So that fellow couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fellow didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. All right. In this video, I want to talk about the timing of the rapture and the time of Jacob's trouble, also known as the Great Tribulation, and how soon does this tribulation period start after the rapture. In a past video on one of my channels, uh, somebody commented because I said, I'm not sure. On this answer I don't know if it's right after some weeks months or year or seven years after I'm not sure I'm not sure if there's a seven years of plenty and then this happens and somebody commented and said oh that's easy it's right after just look at Lot, and that's what you're looking at here Lot and his two daughters leaving here his wife who looked back and sudden destruction and uh this picture brought so much to my mind because i've been thinking about what that guy said and i was like you know what i, I think he might be right because it's almost every day i'm learning about things escalating started off with hamas attack attacking israel and then israel retaliating and then the more and more of the world is getting mad at Israel. And I could say you could, it even started before that with Russia and Ukraine. And then things are, seem to be speeding up a bit. And there's protest for Palestine, protest for Israel. And then Iran, just the other day I heard attacked Pakistan for some reason. I don't know what's going on there. And then today I heard that they attacked Iraq. And I was like, what? And so Iran is becoming very bold and just doing what it's doing. And I was like, okay, these things keep happening. This is going to blow up. And I was talking to the wife about it and just kind of breaking down about hey you know the guy said yeah a lot left destruction and i was like you know what i think that's what's going to happen i heard about the u.s maybe others testing nukes like at the islands over there in the pacific and i was like wow you know what i think this is what is going to happen i think things are going to be destroyed this whole world system is going to be destroyed a lot of its main cities is, are going to be destroyed a good chunk of the population is going to be destroyed and out of the ashes rises the phoenix that the, the new agers and these occultists believe from the fire and the ashes the, the new world order because this has to happen for the, the antichrist to be accepted as jesus thinking that he came to bring peace and order. Uh, no, the person who shows up after this is the false messiah. But Jesus comes afterwards to take out this false messiah. But with this destruction, if people aren't listening now, they might not even get this information. Unless God protects servers with this stuff. He protects hard drives that we put this stuff on. But 
I don't know. A lot of stuff would end up being destroyed in this. And I was thinking about this here. What the guy was saying and when I decided to use a, a picture for a thumbnail. And I saw this coming down. And I was thinking about Revelation. I was like, you know what? I see it. You see, the nations are starting to butt heads. And the way I was describing it to my wife, I thought was very interesting. The stuff that was coming to me when I was talking to her about how a thunderstorm, how there's a charge that builds up in the sky and a charge that builds up on the earth. I'm not sure which one builds up a negative or positive, or it, it doesn't matter. It can be both. I don't know. Either the sky builds up a positive or a negative charge, and the earth starts to build up the opposite. And once those charges really build up, that's when you get lightning. You get the exchange of the energy to balance things out. And we see that right now. And it made me think of when Jesus said, oh, like uh, lightning shines from the east to the west. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. In Matthew 24, this is talking about the rapture, because right afterwards he talks about the Son of Man coming in the clouds and everybody's going to see him. That first thing of lightning, that is the rapture. You know, it goes from east to west, which is very interesting. It's just how Jesus is going to come from the east, go to the west and take all his people, like lightning, in the moment, in a twinkle of an eye, immediately changed in the spirit, right? All that biblical language. Then this is going to happen. So what, if you're around and all of a sudden one of your believing family members or friends just... You might want to go look up. Because, I don't know. You might want to face your death with some boldness, I guess. I don't know. Not saying you're definitely going to die, but if you're in one of the major cities in one of the targeted areas, because all the tares are being gathered together to be burned, and I believe that's exactly what we're going to see happen. We're going to see the first fruits being the rapture taken, then the a good chunk of the tares are going to be burned up, and then there's going to be the main harvest through the time of Jacob's trouble or the Great Tribulation, whatever you feel like calling it. Then Jesus is going to return. And there's going to be a little bit of gleanings from there, I suppose. And that's when he'll establish his millennial kingdom. Reigning from Israel, Jerusalem. And thinking about all this, I was like, yeah, it makes sense. Because we see that charge building up, like the east from the west. This electrical charge building up. And guess what we are told? In connection with the rapture here in 2 Thessalonians, it says at verse 5 in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one, or the wicked, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So we see here, there is a restrainer, right? There's somebody who's letting. Letting can mean to allow something to happen. Letting can also mean withholding, to stop it from happening, right? It's a word that has it, its own opposite meaning within itself. So you have to pay attention to context, right? Kind of... Like some other words you may, you may think of, if you say bear arms, well, it depends on the context. If you're talking about weapons, well, to bear arms, you mean to actually carry and use a weapon, right? But if you're talking about an animal, you're talking about the limbs of a bear. But it's spelled the same way, right? Uh, just an example how when we read here about the Antichrist can't show up until... The restrainer is removed. And this is the spirit that's within us. We are like Lot in the city. And the whole reason why things aren't going to hell is because God's not going to allow that to happen to us. 
Not that we won't go through any kind of tribulation or any kind of trouble or even face death, but we're not going to be part of this because this is going to be the outpouring of God's wrath. So he's going to take us from that. And once we're taken, as we'll see here, Revelation 12, verse 5, it says, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that she should feed that, ah, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Right here is the rapture. And we can see the story of Lot again. You may be saying, how is this the rapture? Well, you see that this woman is Israel. It can be personified by Mary, but Mary never had to flee into the wilderness for three and a half days after Jesus ascended to heaven. Or three and a half years, my bad. Right? And that's how much 2,000 or 8,203 score days ends up being at three and a half years with 12 months per year, 30 days per month. Mary never did that. This has to do with Israel. That's why the woman has 12 stars as a crown. It's the 12 tribes of Israel. And the child brought forth Jesus. He ascends. That's why I also believe we're going to be taken up on Ascension Day or the Feast of Weeks. About 50 days after the first Sabbath, after first fruits. And I believe it can be as soon as this year. If you've been paying attention to my videos in the past where I talk about the rapture, I was putting together a calculation using Matthew 24, where I don't think the rapture could happen until 2024 at the earliest. And if it doesn't happen by 2026, then I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but I was saying this is the earliest it could happen. And we see the tensions are rising, right? And more and more people are being bold and calling out a lot of the perversions in Hollywood and what have you. But anyway, back to what we, we see here. Uh, Jesus is caught up, and you may be saying that's that's not the rapture. Well, we are his body. Right? So that's us being taken up. Just like the woman represents all of Israel, the child represents all of Christianity. True Christians, that is. Because there's a good lot of Christians that are going to be staying here. Because they're Christian in name only. But what's interesting is when we're taken up, where it says here, keep in mind what it says before this, when it talks about the woman, it says that there was also a dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns, and he drew a third part of the stars of heaven with him. Right? With his tail. It says here, at the time the man-child was taken up, it says, and there was war in heaven, at verse 7, Michael and his angel fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought his angels and prevailed not. They, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. When you read Revelation chapter 1, you read about how the stars represent angels, right? And when the devil, he's represented by that dragon, and he brings down a third of the stars, he's bringing a third of the angels with him. That's why it says he's cast out and his angels, or his messengers, with him. And that is what we see here. There's going to, when we're taken up, there's going to be war in heaven. Satan is going to try to fight against God and stop this from happening. Because he wants, of course, more time. And this is manifested on earth. What is happening spiritually is also happening physically. So there's a physical war going on in heaven. You see here, it almost looks like falling stars. Satan is cast down to earth. There's going to be nuclear explosions. Big places are going to blow up and be destroyed. And there's going to be all this war. And that's when these fallen angels who are now here are going to say that they are aliens or humans from the future who came back to try to prevent this or fix this or something, right? 
you know, they're going to come up with some BS story to lie about who they really are. They're fallen angels. And they're going to try to reestablish this new world order. They're going to establish fully the feet of iron and clay. And that's when Jesus finally returns, hits that statue at the feet of Daniel chapter 2. If you don't want know what I meant about the iron and clay, I was just making a video about Daniel chapter 2 in succession. Uh, so that's why I mentioned that. And I just realized I just dropped it out of the blue right here. So you might not know what I mean. Well, check out the previous video I made. Uh, that I think I uploaded right before this one. About succession. And it should have a picture as a thumbnail of the statue of Daniel chapter 2. Um, but anyway... Yeah, so to recap, we're in the world, just like Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah. That, that's representing the world. And like the angel said to Lot, they need to leave before they can destroy this place. Because God's not going to destroy it because we're here. But tensions are building up and things are becoming more and more perverted. Such as what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Where because of Sodom, that's where we get... The words sodomy in sodomite, right? And that's becoming more and more prevalent today, where if you even speak out against it, even to protect children, you are a bigot and you're hateful and you're somehow evil, right? So God is going to judge, and his judgment in this world is war, his judgment in the next is hell. And both war and hell are awful, something you don't want to go through. And when we're finally taken out as the rapture, there is war in heaven. The, the devil and his angels are cast down. This is manifested as war on earth. There's nuclear destruction with these bombs coming down, something physical happening just like the fallen angels are being cast down as well. There's a spiritual thing going on along with the physical. Then the Antichrist is going to claim to be Jesus, either posing as aliens coming to help or as humans from the future coming to help or some other thing they just came up with from a uh, parallel universe or something. They're going to come up with something to try to convince you that they're not fallen angels, that it's not Satan. Uh, even that they're gods and they're here to help and they try to reestablish a one world order, a one world government with a one world religion and all those who oppose it, they are going to put to death and people are going to think they're doing God's work by doing this and eventually they're going to become anti-Semitic even though at first they're probably going to give a thumbs up to the Jews so that you think he's the Messiah but then they're going to turn on him and it's going to be like Nazi Germany, where they want to exterminate the Jews. And then Jesus returns and destroys everybody that's coming against Israel. And he establishes his kingdom in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And as of right now, that's all you need to know. That's all the detail you need to know. But, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's how it's going to happen. It's going to happen pretty soon. Like I said, uh, as soon as this spring, summertime, at the Feast of Weeks at Ascension Day, when Jesus ascended, I was always saying that the two days I think that we would be taken would be either on Ascension Day when Jesus went up in Acts or on the Feast of Trumpets. And now I'm pretty sure it's the Feast of of weeks because that's when we'd be taken up and then the feast of trumpets would represent our actual marriage going on and there was three feasts where all the males had to present themselves before the lord it was i believe it's first fruits that's when jesus rose from the dead and then he rose up uh, many of the saints from the dead with him and I believe he presented them before the Lord. That's why he told the women who saw him when he came out of the tomb, don't touch me because I haven't gone to my father. 
But then afterwards, when he talked to the disciples, he's like, hey, touch my hand and feel the side. Don't doubt, Thomas. Look, it's me. And so he allowed him to touch him because he already went to the Father. So uh, that was a first resurrection kind of thing, like a first fruits, I guess. Then you're going to have the rapture before all of this happens, right? All this mess that you see before you in this picture, as presented by Lot leaving, right? And this, I believe, is going to be the Feast of Weeks, where Jesus, he's the body of Christ, right? He went up, we read in Revelation, that when Jesus is caught up, that's when the woman has to flee into the wilderness for three and a half years, right? Well, we're going to be the rest of his body, where his toes, right? The last part to come out of the womb. And we're going to go up, and then this destruction happens. And then the last feast, where all the males had to present themselves before the Lord, was the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is going to be the final resurrection at the end, where Jesus tabernacles with us here on earth, where he's reigning as king. So we see each part of the harvest going on right there. So, yeah, I, it all seems to be becoming more and more clear. I think it's becoming more and more clear because it's about to happen. But time will tell, right? So, uh, I guess the last thing I'll say here is if there is a rapture and I'm still here, probably don't want to listen to me for two reasons either i'm not taken because i'm not saved i have no idea what i'm talking about i am deceived so don't listen to me i'm obviously something's wrong right second is it might not be me especially a lot of times here you don't see my face you hear my voice they got the ai that can duplicate your voice and even if i was showing my face they can use the ai to duplicate the face they can even do holograms to make it look like you're here, right? So unless you know me personally and you know whether I'm here or not, uh, don't listen to me after a rapture. Because either I was wrong, right? So why listen to me? Or it's not really me. So either way, be warned of that. Hopefully you watched that far to get to that warning. But anyway, thanks for watching. Take care. All right. I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos, encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures. As we read here in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2, it says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of of our faith an author is somebody who writes and in romans chapter 10 verses 16 and 17 it says but they have not all obeyed the gospel for isaiah saith lord who hath believed our report so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god so you see here how jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible, the scriptures are the written word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world. And that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses. And that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting. Because Isaiah 
has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? Uh, it is written. To search the scriptures. Bring them up. They testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested in the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Berians noble. For hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger. Trying to kidnap you, right? And what does Jesus tell us about the word in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change, where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being, by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit and become one with his spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the Word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified, so that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you, and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here. 
John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name, they're prophesying in his name, they're casting out devils in his name, they're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as Adam knew Eve and she conceived. You need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. And there was a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God, that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed, so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness, he says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person, and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously he's a pompous ass. Right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass. And all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying, this guy's not a Christian. You never listen to a thing I say because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake, feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just, instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're an immature Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, 
have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy by the end of this. Take care. So that fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? <laughs> didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. Just like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that.